in this talk today on behalf of myself and my colleague Vincent Mum. I'm going to present part of a project that has a combined number of methodologies that gives us a strong reassurance that what we have discovered has a strong likelihood um, of being true. Further, um, various immersion technologies, one of which we will show last, um, themselves create visual scenarios that have allowed us to make discoveries that we would have otherwise not uncovered for a very long time, perhaps not even at all. And lastly, uh, very importantly, it has allowed us to actually see how prehistoric sites in the Bronze Age worked and what, um, what it might have been like to have been there ourselves 3,500 years ago, standing in small valleys in Western Scotland, surrounded by megalithic landscapes, in particular, prehistoric calendar landscapes. Okay. I'd like to get rid of that uh, bottom, but never mind. So just quickly the overview of the presentation. I'm going to tell you something about what I mean by calendar landscapes. I'm going to give you a background of the project and some theoretical interpretive discussions that have already gone on throughout this project over a decade. And then our case study site of Loch Bui, which is on the Isle of Mull. And then hopefully at least one video, depending on time. So what do I think about calendar landscapes? What do I mean by that? For me and Vincent at least, a calendar landscape is a landscape in which certain landmarks enable an observer to make an accurate estimate of the progress of the year. <clears throat> Do we have water? Yes. Sorry. I'm, I'm losing my voice. <clears throat> Okay, someone else can do that. <laughs> <laughs> landmarks really, um, so as I was saying, certain landmarks enable an observer to make an accurate estimate of the progress of the year. Landmarks really, in the broadest sense, might be topographic features like rocks, hilltops, notches in the horizon, but even very old trees. We know trees grow to, you know, at least 800 years old. And we know, for example, we have bushes in Australia that, um, that are, this is a bush, that can be 2,000 years old. So also there could be river confluences, really any other natural phenomena that might have appeared to last forever in the landscape or has a long-term connection in the landscape. The human constructions might be things that are pretty obvious to most archaeologists, wooden posts, stones, burial markers, tombs, wells, or indeed a combination of these. Our assumptions have been that the combinations of these landmarks will create an alignment um, that the observer would position themselves at, say, the first landmark, and then look towards the second landmark. And this alignment creates a direction which the observer should look to observe the rising or setting of an astronomical body, which tells them how far the year has progressed, or rather, perhaps, where in the cycle of life and death or indeed creation, their own places now. So here we are. So I work in Scotland. We, we work in Scotland. In particular, Western Scotland. Our main uh, area of study has actually been the Isle of Mull most recently. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. I went twice. Hmm. Okay, so you can see our Loch Bui area here. It seems to have slipped along and missed out a nice area. Okay, I'm just going to try one more slide. Okay, it's interesting. This has happened previously with Prezi um, on here where it actually doesn't go to where it's supposed to, when you just click it once. Apologies for that. I don't know how why it slipped five slides. So moving on. So it may be known to most of you um, about this Western Scottish uh, Scotland's project that most of the work to date has been statistical, where the following events in the past have been statistically tested and are statistically supported. These are namely the alignments of monuments, orientations to specific places on the horizon. We're just talking about points on the horizon, but also then specific celestial phenomena, 
the actual shape of the horizon that surrounds the sites in comparison to other sites in the same regions have been shown to be statistically different to those random points. And finally, and quite complicatedly, that there is a deliberate connection between the very first, I say, Neolithic great circles in Scotland and the simpler standing stone sites that were erected nearly two millennia later in the Late Bronze Age. And those connections were that they have the same orientation choice, the same astronomical, uh, astronomical targets, and the same horizon shapes. And all of these have been tested for and shown to be positively supported across Western Scotland and other areas of Scotland. Many of these statistical tests were first presented at CAA or CEC or the EAA, um, including, uh, for example, alignments within the designs of great single great circles, so statistics were developed for one site, but also we're doing regional comparisons, uh, for example, of simple standing stones. Whilst, while statistical work is still a very significant factor in our research, our work has really moved beyond these statistically tested concepts of the traditions and patterns of special places and landscape settings. This is done by restructuring our person-centred view instead of across regions to focus literally on one place at a time. And we do this in order to discover the very detailed workings of one site that may be unique just to that site and which may or may not be shared with any other sites in the vicinity. We do, though, make sure that we focus upon those landscapes and monuments individually where we already have statistical support for the essential questions of intentionalities I've just mentioned. So getting back to calendar landscapes, obviously um, they're not a new notion. And we've seen uh, that it comes up regularly in discussions on meaning of alignments, the sun, the moon, but it also appears in notional and symbolic concepts of nature and how people think about nature in the past. The first thing I want to emphasise is that I do not believe that such orientations are actually linked to the daily life like farming. Usually you find people talk about astronomy, particularly in the Neolithic, it's all, oh, it must be because they're farmers now. I, I just cannot, that does not cut with me at all. Mainly because, not in the literal sense at least, People clearly know when to plant. They know when to sow. They know when to reap. They don't need a stone to tell them when to sow, what to do, and so forth. And traditionally, anyway, we know that the details of sowing and planting and things is usually done by the phases of the moon in coincidence with the solar calendar. <clears throat> Obviously, though, I think that the stones and nature are really part of the social fabric of a community and were known as such. Various human groups have known how nature generally works surely for hundreds of thousands of years. They know how to move through the landscape using their stars, for example. They know when animals are going to move across when you mark a particular constellation. If you want to know what I really think standing stones are about in Western Scotland, for instance, and we don't have time to go through that today, you can take a look at these particular articles, particularly the first and the last one, which will be coming out this year. But suffice to say, some of the conclusions include the idea that standing stone buildings uh, in some ways uh, really express many millennia of tradition, but perhaps slightly differing ways across time. But they're always anchored in living time as part of the observed and unobserved natural world. A bit more talking before immersion. <laughs> Some of what I'm talking about today has actually been using uh, immersive technologies that we've used in the past and presented here at other conferences in the past. So I'm just quickly giving you that sense of what we're talking about. So now the project has studied many trends in prehistoric landscapes and skyscape systems that have been set up by users of these, um, the people who use these stones. We have uh, begun to focus in detail, as I've said, about these systems in micro-local contexts like Loch Bui. So regarding methodology, the micro-local contexts are discovered by combining the classic or basic perspectives of individual site alignments and or geometric arrangements across the site constituents, as well as the individual view of the entire land and skyscape surrounding each site from the perspective of a single standing stone or single monument within a site, thus in the place designated by the standing stone or other possible indicator. We then analyse all these different individual components separately 
and then we bring them together for the final interpretation of the site. And for our visual confirmation of what we think we know, we create the videos of the landscapes and the skyscape scenes found at these sites at the time they were built, which is 1500 BC, in the case of our uh, site today. The entire 360 views are made up as a combination of digitally created 3D landscape panoramas and or photographs which are then inserted into a video software called Stellarium. This creates high resolution videos of the day and night skies at chosen dates and locations. Note too that quite often new discoveries were actually made by observing things in Stellarium. So let's, let's move on and see how these things unfold. <clears throat> okay, reminder, Isle of Mal. Here we go. So here we have our um, sites. Stone circle, two outliers, they're about two meters high. We have a curved can over here, and up here we have a standing slab. First site, action. This is C, right at the top. For you, it was right over there. This slab is very thin and long. Thin, okay. This particular stone is actually oriented towards um, what we call uh, a major point in the lunar calendar, which actually lasts 18.6 years. It's not 30 days. And what I mean by a point in the lunar calendar is the moon, just like the sun at the solstice, has the most extreme points it reaches on the northern horizon in its rising and setting and the southern. And these points are only touched upon approximately every 18.6 years. And for this particular slab, it's in the, uh, in the north horizon. Thank you. Northern horizon, rising moon. The stone circle, Lothbui stone circle. This is a 3D landscape around the circle that you can see. Now what we did, I'll just say this very quickly so we can go into our video, is um, we did our statistical test just like we did on the great circles to find out whether we actually had stones oriented on particular um, astronomical phenomena and we were very sad to discover it said no we thought, Damn, maybe tom was right stone circles aren't oriented towards astronomical phenomena much weeping but actually what we found out when we, on the nice picture that's here, you will see, in fact, that what happened, and I'll just use this to show you uh, as a rough guide, I think it's this one. This one actually was dead on, dead on, pointing to the major, which you can hardly see here. See how the moon skims on the horizon? The major moon setting, that's only once every 18.6 years in there. It was dead on. But then we found that the sides the our alignments on this side were all out by plus six, sorry, minus six degrees. I thought, that's weird. And then we check the other side, all out by plus six degrees. And it turns out that in fact, if you're standing here and you're lining up on this side, da -da, you get a hit. Same for that side. Then after you cross the boundary of the marker, which actually is dead on, they're then out by plus six degrees on the other side. But if you go to the other side of the stone, the right hand side, they actually hit. We just thought this was a very, very unusual. We've never come across that before. Okay, so this is the stone circle and what's happening there, but let's quickly move on. I'll show you this, then we're going to the video. We then looked at the geometric connections between these different sites. Here we have the circle. If you're standing at the circle and you're looking at the closest outlier, the circle is actually aligned to the winter sunset using this stone. Center of the stone though, center of the circle. From stone C, the slab, through the center of the circle, you get the winter sunrise. From the circle to the can, the summer solstice sunset. And then you get the summer solstice sunrise from the other outlier through the center of the circle. Why well, this is really interesting is we don't have any summer solstitial alignments in the stone circle. And what's terribly interesting, though I am jumping ahead because I have to, is the fact that the can must have come first because there is no alignment coming from away from the can to any of the other objects. 
So I'm going to show you the video of what it is like to move from one stone to the circle to another stone, back to the circle and so on, viewing the sunrise and sunsets from this geometrical pattern. Oh. Okay, who's toilet? <laughs> uh, this says bottom. MP4, the name. Oh, yep, yeah, I got it. This one. No. Vincent? Right. Up. Thank you. Computer man. Okay, no, no music, I'm afraid. Okay, so here we have the sunrise. <clears throat> We're going to be standing at the slab, looking straight through the middle of the circle. At this time, there were likely open forests or no trees. <coughs> so you can see the little white thing up there. We're looking at to the sign circle. I would like to repeat that because I should have drawn your attention to it earlier and you would have seen the sun coming out. We're now going to be standing in the centre of the circle looking towards stone B for the winter sun set. So you would have been here and you walk down to the circle, come to the circle at the end of the day and then look out. Standing in the circle, looking across from the up one stone to another stone. So this one you're not looking at, this just happens to be a small See the sun is so low um, and let's see how it pulls in around the white stone the light. <coughs> Standing here, looking through the circle. we're standing at a different stone, that's the other outlier. We're looking through the circle, centre of the circle, the sun has arisen at the summer solstice. <coughs> Sorry. Last one. Circle through to the can at the summer solstice sunset. So here's the sun, here we are in the circle, here's the can. So the sun itself is hitting here, the centre of the sun hits the horizon. Um, so I think really that this talk has shown that the creation of this calendar style landscape is created by the geometrical aligned components. But further, I think the site was built up over a series of stages in order to incorporate more and more alignments so that in some ways it now equates to the ancestor monuments of the Great Circle. We think that the curb can came first, and this is suggested by the fact that no alignment is made viewing from the can. can sorry. All of the alignments that, are, that include the can face towards the can. Perhaps the stone slab or the stone circle was second. These new results show how prehistoric peoples choreographed the appearance and travels of other celestial phenomena in relation to the horizon and monuments. But importantly, our immersion experience has shown us in particular how this works with the monuments in the landscape. The images I think are quite striking. It was the staging of the appearance and disappearance and travelling of the sun and moon that enabled their concepts of time to be experienced, shared and acknowledged by prehistoric peoples, ensuring that the order of the cosmos, I think, in some ways is constant and reassuring, telling us that thousands of years later too, that the people of the megalithic past believe that Loch Bui was a focal point of the cosmological system and astronomical knowledge. Thank you.